Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is start off with some introductions, and if I get my staff to come up to the front of the room here.
That's okay. I, I don't need it. So, uh, and I'm Sheriff Jim Arnott. I uh, am the sheriff. I started in 1988 uh, as a deputy sheriff, as a reserve, worked my way up uh, in the patrol division for about five years, uh, spent most of my career in criminal investigations as a detective, and then was promoted uh, to sergeant lieutenant and then captain. And then under Sheriff Jack Merrick, I was promoted to chief deputy, uh, which is now filled by two majors. Uh, but as chief deputy, I, I learned a lot about the sheriff's office and the operations. And uh, then I decided to run for sheriff, and uh, I'll be going on, I'll be completing my second term, so eight years. Uh, sheriff, with the sheriff's office, 20 years, so next year I'll be starting my 29th year at the sheriff's office. So I've, I've been there a little while and, and uh, seen a lot of things happen in the community, and, and uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to, to host this. What I'd like to do, uh, today is kind of a solemn day for us because um, in 2007, uh, we lost uh, Deputy Gary McCormick uh, in the line of duty uh, on this day. And so we'd like to uh, not only recognize him, but today a St. Louis County uh, police officer, uh, Blake Snyder, lost his life in the line of duty here in Missouri. And we'd like to take a moment of silence to honor them. If you would, bow your head with me. Thank you very much. Like I said, I appreciate your presence. I appreciate you coming out tonight. What we want to do is give you some information to take back. Uh, also may be able to give you some information that causes you to ask some questions. Uh, we'll kind of, kind of clarify some of the laws that passed uh, in August in our latest session. Uh, but before we do that, what I want to do is introduce you to the Sheriff's Office uh, by each division. I'm going to have the majors and the captains talk a little bit about what's going on in their divisions. And I'll start with uh, Major Spaulding, who's gonna talk about uh, jail population and uh, trends of crimes that we have inmates uh, in jail for. So, Major. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, we've got a lot to get to today. And so I've got some boring numbers to start with. Uh, or at least they're kind of boring to us. Maybe they'll be interesting to you. Uh, Captain Denny said that he uh, oversees the corrections staff. Um, there's 176 corrections officers that their main function is to um, oversee the, the, the inmates that are in the facility. Um, today uh, we had about we had 608 inmates inside the facility um, and we had another 62 that were housing in other facilities outside of our county uh, at other jails. And those, those people are responsible for making sure that they get to court, uh, make sure that they are housed and fed and medically taken care of. Um, we spend a lot of time on, on medical and mental health with, these, with the individuals. Um, <clears throat> an average length of stay, I get asked that question quite often. How long does an average inmate stay in the facility? And we've calculated that, that an average inmate stays 27 days. Um, that's a little deceiving because we also have people there that have been there four years. Uh, not many, but we do on occasion have people stay that long. <clears throat> um, our average daily population so far this year is 712. Um, and, our, and our high for this year is 765. So uh, one day this, this year sometime, I don't remember what the date was, we actually had 765 inmates in our custody. Uh, and 601 beds to put them in. So you can imagine uh, uh, what kind of a job they have trying to keep those, keep those kinds of numbers safe. Um, I also wanted to touch just for a second on the types of criminals because I know that becomes a, a question quite frequently. Uh, you'll read in the media or social media, well, if you just let those guys that are smoking dope out of jail, you'd have more bed space. Well, we don't have any of those people in the jail. Um, I don't know where that myth comes from. But uh, today we had, uh, I'll just kind of pick out some of these. We had 27 inmates in there for first degree robbery. We had 27 inmates for domestic assault. We had uh, 30 inmates in there for tampering with motor vehicles. Those are normally uh, stealing motor vehicles. Uh, 30 for second degree burglary. 
34 for second degree domestic assault, 41 for tampering with motor vehicles, 44 uh, felony drug possessions, um, and 46 forgeries. Um, so those are the types of individuals. You have it, I don't have it on my sheet. You know how many homicide? That's actually down a little bit. I think we've got. Yeah, that number is always kind of surprising. Uh, we'll, we'll have at any given time somewhere between 10 and 20 homicide victims. We've recently gotten rid of half a dozen. Uh, so that number always kind of surprises. At one time we had six or seven females in that, in that category. So um, one other interesting statistic when I'm speaking of females, that's probably our fastest growing uh, population in the jail facility is females. Uh, about six or seven years ago, we were averaging around 40 uh, female inmates per day, and now it's not unlikely, or uh, not unusual to have 125, 130 females in the facility. So that, that's really increased over the last few years. Right, sure. Thanks, Major. Uh, Captain Denny, uh, talk about the current types of assaults uh, and things that actually happen in the jail and the kind of contraband we run across. <coughs> Um, a lot of times when we give tours of the jail, we call them, it's a small city. So we have basically the same types of crimes and stuff going on in the jail that you have outside the jail. But, well, that's the last time. Go ahead. Just oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, some of the types of crimes that we have are assaults, inmate on inmate. Um, this year so far we've had about 53 um, assaults, you know, inmate on inmate, just fights. And then we've had eight assaults on staff so far this year. Um, a couple of them are pretty serious. Uh, we have to take our officers to the hospital. Um, one ended up with um, some fractures and stuff in their face. It was on the news quite a bit. And we actually had one assault on an attorney. An inmate assaulted his own attorney. And some of the methods that we use to avoid those, uh, obviously we can't have firearms in the jail. Uh, those will be taken away from us. You know, we're overpowered very easily with the numbers that we have. So we carry uh, OC, pepper spray. Um, or we have a cert team, which if we have somebody that's being combated or someone in their cell like that, we activate the cert team. We've had 25 activations so far this year to gain control of someone that was in their cell. Um, we have property damage to the jail where an inmate that's upset will tear a sprinkler out of the ceiling, uh, break glass. Uh, those types of things. Uh, as far as contraband in the jail, um, these people are sometimes desperate people that are, have addictions, so they try to you know, get what they can into the jail. Uh, we found just about all variety of uh, narcotics that you can think of that they smuggle in in various ways. Um, homemade things in the jail to just entertain themselves, you know, nuisance <coughs> contraband. There's kind of two types of contraband. There's nuisance contraband and hazardous contraband. Um, but just about anything you can think of as far as contraband, they try to get in. Uh, alcohol, you know, they try to make it if they can, but we don't really have much problem with that. We've got a really good staff that keeps that under control. Um, we don't have near the contraband problems as a lot of jails do. Um, I praise my staff for that. Um, for the volume of people we have coming in and out of our facility, uh, they do a phenomenal job taking care of the jails. And I'm not bragging because I run that jail, but it's the most organized, best ran jail I've ever been in. I've been in jails all over the state and other states, and I, I can't praise my staff enough. They actually run the jail, not me. <laughs> Thanks, Captain. You know, another thing uh, also with the jail, the reason why I wanted the captain to kind of talk about that is you hear a lot on the news and a lot in the media about 
assaulting police officers, but you don't hear a lot of news about what happens in the facility where the, the 600 plus inmates are. And it's a very dangerous place to work. And we are proud of, of how the staff interact with inmates. One thing that we teach uh, is interpersonal communication because it's a lot easier to talk a group into doing something than it is to forcing them into doing something. And that's, that's why we have a lot less assaults than uh, most correctional facilities, and we use a lot less force than any other correctional facility, uh, probably in Missouri. Uh, our stats are, are really good, and uh, they do a great job. And it's all about communication. Okay, so next is uh, Captain Kudrow. Well, as you know, with those types of inmate numbers, um, we have to feed these people. <laughs> uh, we have to give them medical care, and uh, part of my duties is to oversee those things uh, as far as the kitchen. Uh, our kitchen staff, we have uh, seven correctional staff uh, officers that oversee the uh, cooking and uh, the meal preparation. And uh, they, uh, so far this year, uh, have served uh, 665,000 meals as of the end of last month. So it's a lot of meals. It's about 1,800, uh, 1,900 meals a day that uh, get cooked in that kitchen. And it's uh, um, put on tray carts and that type of uh, system and taken to the housing unit where they stay and they eat their meals. Uh, we are able to prepare those meals for about $1.35 a day, or $1.35 a meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do it uh, fairly uh, efficient, and uh, the inmate workers, they also come down, and they assist the kitchen staff as far as delivering those meals and uh, cleaning up the kitchen and those types of things. So uh, as far as medical, mental health, uh, obviously these people are not in the best of health when they uh, arrive with us. Um, some of the uh, inmates, when they get there, they're out often, uh, you know, sick uh, or uh, have a me real serious medical issues. And uh, as far as the uh, intakes when they come in, we have uh, about 260 uh, inmates every month that have to be seen as what we consider uh, the uh, chronic care um, inmates that need to be seen. Um, those people have, you know, uh, di diabetes, um, they have hypertension, HIV sometimes. Uh, a lot of them have seizure dis disorders. Um, but obviously those people have to be seen quickly and then in that 24 hour period. Um, as far as uh, medications, um, our inmates, um, we average probably about 260 inmates uh, per day that take some type of medication. Um, we do two med passes a day, so there's a lot of medication getting passed throughout the facility also. Um, some of the other interesting things that as far as sick calls, we do, uh, our uh, nursing staff do about 320 sick calls a month. Uh, that's what we're averaging so far this year. So obviously, um, once they get there, they, if they don't have issues, they seem to get them. So. <laughs> Thanks, Captain. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, it, the captains didn't talk about that's really important to you, the citizen, is how much inmate work labor we use. Uh, pretty much everything in the jail, uh, all the cleaning, all the cooking, uh, all the, the trash, all that stuff is done by inmate labor. Uh, it's overseen by staff, but we use inmate labor. So we take that outside. I think some of you have probably seen the story uh, on it last week, but uh, you know, we mow the courthouse lawn, uh, we pick up trash on the roadways, we need, I think that's a better way to, for our tax dollars to be stressed a little bit farther by using these inmates to complete the work. They're not doing anything anyway. So uh, we're gonna put them to work and that's what we've done. And, and our, our facility has run excellent that way and uh, things are really good with that. Um, we pay some 
some different jobs pay like a dollar a day is what they'll they'll earn in a credit uh, to be used in the commissary and, and the uh, inmate work crew that's on the outside is a dollar an hour. So, um, and sometimes that money will go back to back child support or something like that also. So, some really good things happening with that. So I'm proud of that program. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Captain Johnson, the patrol captain, come up and talk about uh, some current crime, crime trends and uh, some things that are going on uh, down here in what we call District 4 and 5. Uh, and tell you a little bit about what's happening. David? <clears throat> um, before I start with the uh, crime change, I just want to tell you a little bit about our patrol division and kind of the area that we cover. Um, in the unincorporated population, that's everything outside of the city limit, and I'm talking about Willard, anything outside of any of those city limits, Springfield, we have about 85,000 people. Um, in the unincorporated area. That's the people that we go out and protect. Now, we can enforce laws inside of any of the city limits, anywhere in Greene County, we have jurisdiction, um, but we take calls for service only in the unincorporated areas. Uh, we have a patrol staff of 60 people, 60 deputies, um, that go out and, and, and serve and protect every day. Um, we have uh, our counties broken up into five main districts, and uh, we have at any one time at least five deputies on and one supervisor. Uh, just kind of picture the, the amount of area that we cover. Um, Green County in the unincorporated areas uh, is 600 square miles. And picture five districts with five deputies and one supervisor. That's any one time we have at least one officer for every 100 square miles. Uh, to kind of put that in more perspective, the city limits of Springfield is about 95 square miles, and they have 340, 350 officers to patrol that. Uh, now their population is about 160,000, which is a little bit uh, about double what we have, but we still have you know a pretty big area responsibility um, to cover, and uh, we have <coughs> uh, not enough deputies to do it. But given that, um, I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, what's happening in your area. Um, I wanted to kind of go over residential burglaries and stealing. That's primarily affecting you folks. Uh, so far, uh, we've noticed a decrease from September to August. Um, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, in August, we had uh, 29 residential burglaries. And in September, Last week we had 22, so we're down a little bit in uh, residential burglaries, and we're also down in stealing. Last uh, last month we had 108 stealing uh, cases, and this month we've had, or September, we had 61. So that's a good thing that we've gone down there. Um, however, um, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about stealing from vehicles. Um, we continue to have many thefts of stealing vehicles. A lot of those 61 that you see there, 108 last month, were actually stealing from vehicles. Uh, most of these uh, occurred during the overnight or early morning hours, um, and people are still, even though we've put out information and tell them to stop, lock it to stop it and all this stuff, people are still leaving valuables inside their, uh, their vehicles, including purses, wallets, laptops, money, and even firearms. And, and you know, they'll, they'll pull up in the driveway at the end of their night and, and just get out and a lot of them leave their doors unlocked and a firearm tucked underneath the front seat. Well, the crooks know where that's at. Um, there has been an increase in commercial burglaries and stolen vehicles and I can kind of explain what's going on there. Um, in uh, September or in August we had 10 commercial burglaries and in September we had 20. That seems like a huge jump and I can explain that. Um, stolen vehicles, we've also, we, in uh, August we had 12, and, and last month we had 20. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. The uh, majority of the increases in the commercial burglaries are occurring at storage facilities. Um, when this occurs, each storage unit, if you can picture a, a row of you know, 100 storage units, each individual garage, um, if a suspect were to get in there and rifle through 20 of those, we have to treat each one of those as a separate burglary. So we'll take 20 reports in one storage unit. And uh, when we go to the map, I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about um, as far as that's concerned, because there's only three dots on the map for those, those uh, commercial burglaries. 
but we've had 20 of them in the last month. That's because somebody went and hit a storage unit. Um, huh? Oh, okay. Um, stolen vehicles. Um, there's a, a huge trend in stolen vehicles, and it's not only happening here at the sheriff's office, but it's happening um, in Springfield too. Um, I think that one of the jail numbers, they're, they're talking about 30 to 40 inmates being in the jail for stealing vehicles. It's not like one group that's doing it. Um, unfortunately, in much of the drug community, um, this, you know, it spreads on how to go about stealing vehicles. And um, they, they tell, you know, so-and-so this, and, and next thing you know, there's all these groups out there stealing vehicles. And that, that's kind of what we're facing. Um, primarily, they're stealing pickup trucks. And they're stealing pickup trucks because they're easy to take off road if we try to chase them, and easy to lose us. I mean, that's, you know, unfortunately, and they're easy to steal. Um, uh, a lot of Fords and Dodges, especially the little older models, are easy to crack their ignition and start it with a screwdriver. So, unfortunately, we, we see that quite often. Um, other vehicles, people just leave their doors unlocked with their keys inside. So, you know, somebody that's breaking into cars will use that as a crime of opportunity to go ahead and steal a vehicle. If they're breaking into a car, they check the door, the door's open, hey, hey, I'm going to go in here and rifle through it. Oh, wait a minute, the keys are inside. So next thing you know, they're driving down the road with your car. Um, some of these vehicles, especially the trucks, are being stolen from car lots. And in the map, I'll, I'll also show you uh, kind of what that looks like. Um, that will have a bunch of clusters around one little area. Well, that's not because, you know, we've got a burglar ring going around there, but they're stealing from that car lot. Um, so we, we have a, a, a huge problem with stolen vehicles, and, uh, and uh, we're trying to combat that. So we have had a, uh, a recent vandalism trend, and I don't know if anyone's here is from north, uh, north of town out um, in, uh, um, in uh, the Beverly Hills subdivision. Um, but uh, we had a, a couple of what we believe juveniles or, or teenagers going around and uh, busting windows with eggs. And you say, how can you bust a window with egg? Well, if you freeze it, oh. <laughs> it's, it's like a rock. <laughs> so um, we've had that problem. Um, we've had about 10 vehicles um, damaged with windows uh, during the overnight hours uh, just earlier this month. So I just wanted to throw it out there in case anyone's living over there on the north side. So. Um, that's something that we're addressing um, with our overnight guys to, to, to keep that from happening. Okay. You can tell them about how to get to the mapping, crime mapping system. And just to search some of those for themselves. I'm going to show you some crime trend maps. Um, um, everyone at the sheriff's office has access to, to this mapping software that um, I'm going to show you a, a map of, uh, uh, I believe this is going to be, let's see the first one. Is a residential burglary map and all those little blue dots is somebody's house that got broken into now that's a little misleading because uh, we have people that uh, break into other drug dealers house to steal the drugs and the people that live there are bright enough to call us um, yeah we, we have that happen. Um, but a lot of those are actually you know somebody going up to a house and, and entering illegally and then stealing jewelry stealing Firearms, stealing, you know, whatever you got laying around, they're going to take. Um, so if you want to look around there, especially the southwest area, we've been having a lot of problems with, with that, and, and we're addressing that. It's hard to do on day shift because we don't know what vehicle belongs there and what vehicles don't. So if we're driving down the street, it's almost possible uh, for us to tell uh, who belongs there or who doesn't. And I'm, a, and I'm sure that the, the a major and the, the Captain Weatherford are going to address kind of what to do in, in those certain situations to prevent that. Um, the next map is stealing from vehicles. Now you notice that we have a lot of those. And unfortunately, a lot of them are in this area, the southwest por portion of the county. And every night our deputies go out there and drive through your neighborhoods, usually with their lights off at 3 a.m. Believe me, I've done it a million times when I was on patrol. Stealing from vehicles um, used to be more of a juvenile crime you know, you get some 16, 17 year olds out there doing it, but now it's moved to the mainstream drug um, uh, users that are out there looking to score money for drugs. And we've seen a lot more adults breaking into vehicles, um, getting checks, getting, you know, debit cards, credit cards, um, and going out and using those within an hour or two of that vehicle being broken into. 
And so we have a huge problem with that, and, and we're trying to address it every night by going out there patrolling. And we do have success. We do catch these guys quite often, but it's usually from a tip from you guys. Um, when the public, public calls in and reports something suspicious. So that's just uh, how we go about dealing with that. Um, as you can see, well, there's four dots on there, yet we had 20 commercial burglaries. That shows you where the storage units are. Um, you know, some of them are actually true, legitimate commercial burglaries. Um, like, like, you know, somebody breaking into a, a, a business for, for whatever reason, but most of them are storage units. So, you know, that, that's a problem that we had. We, we uh, have had some success here recently, too, in catching some of those people that have broken into storage units. We've been working with them. They've been giving us their gate codes so we can go in at night and drive around and check for, for people. So we've had some good luck there, too. And, of course, our vehicle thefts. And if you can see the cluster down in the southwest part of the county, right there underneath the, spring, the S in Springfield and to the left, that's a car lot. They've been ripped off time and time and time again um, stealing trucks. If you look around the county, you know, we still have a problem with people going and in, in, in breaking into to vehicles and then stealing. So, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of parking your vehicle in your garage if you can. Clean it out. Do whatever you need to do. Have a garage sale, make some money. But uh, we do have a huge problem with, with vehicle thefts, and unfortunately, when we get in behind these guys, they don't stop. And next thing you know, you know, we're, we're trying our best to, to, to end a pursuit um, before, before, uh, before they get away. So. Um, but that's pretty much it on my end, and uh, thank you for listening, and I'll turn it over. Okay. okay, so some things about crime prevention and awareness. I'll have uh, Major Corcoran and Captain Weatherford uh, come up and talk about that, and then after they're done, uh, Corporal Ustry is going to go into actually showing you how to use the crime map uh, that is up there, and, and we, have, we have access to that also, to learn what's going on in your neighborhood. I think I'd like to give you a little overview. For those of you who don't know, I think Captain Johnson did well in covering uh, um, kind of what a patrolman does and where they do it in Greene County. And he explained that it was in the unincorporated areas. And so I just want to expand on that and let you know if you don't know and if it's um, redundant or common knowledge, and I apologize. I don't think anyone here is, is, is dumb, but a lot of people really don't know what a deputy sheriff does. For years, uh, you know, I've been asked many, many, many times, what do you do? Where do you work? What do the police do? Are you the police? You're not the police? What do you do? <laughs> so those things, I mean, it's just been a career full of that. I think as we've grown, we've become a very large and recognized agency. In fact, the biggest sheriff in the state is, uh, we're, we're it now. So uh, what I'd like to let you, can I let you know how, how, how it kind of works? So when you report a crime and you call 911, and you always call 911 in Greene County to get uh, a response, even if it's not an emergency, people just have a hard time dialing those numbers when, they're, when their house isn't on fire or they're not in danger, but you call 911 to get an emergency. We're happy to talk to you if you want to talk about a neighbor's barking dog or your mailbox vandalism, that's how you get us to you. So don't be afraid to use that uh, system. But when you have a crime to report or something you want to talk about, you call 911. Deputy comes out, and in the case of a burglary or whatever your crime is, um, if it's something extensive that needs follow-up, the deputy sheriff in the uniform in the marked car will come to your house. He'll gather some information from you. He'll take a report, uh, make arrests, and do whatever he can do. He'll, he'll do a preliminary investigation, and if it can't be resolved, and if there are leads to follow, or potential leads to follow, uh, that case will go from the patrol officer's hand to the detective's hand. And this is what Captain Weatherford uh, told you that he manages is our criminal investigations division. So a case, a complicated case, a more complex case, goes into the hands of a detective. They manage cases over time. They have a lot more resources and training, and they follow you. A burglary is a good example. They follow leads on a burglary, like uh, by checking pawn shops and uh, some of the intelligence resources that, that, that they have access to. And they'll work that burglary, your burglary, to the very end until they either run out of leads or they've got someone in jail and some property to give back to you. So that said, and then the third division that, that, that I have is uh, the administrative division. That's under Jeremy, uh, Captain Jeremy Lynn. And uh, just an interesting aspect or an important angle to that is, I think, the professional standards division. So I told you kind of how the police work works. Uniformed deputies come out and take reports. They're followed up by detectives who are directly in contact with you. 
And then uh, one of the things that Captain Lynn runs is our professional standards division. Now, we formed that, I think it was last year? Year before? We formed the professional standards division. To you, it might be known, it, uh, what would be familiar to you would be internal affairs. So two things that, that division does are internal affairs, we investigate uh, complaints and allegations of misconduct by deputies that we take very, very seriously. And uh, I think one of the very important things that they do is uh, our hiring. They do all of our screening, <coughs> pre-hiring, uh, and then post-hiring investigations on the employees and the people that we hire. So uh, he, his folks do also play a role in what we do on the, on the street as far as quality of people that we uh, bring in. Uh, I guess we'll talk to you a little about some crime prevention. Okay. <clears throat> Um, right now, this is going to be starting to get um, cold out in the morning, and uh, obviously, if you park your car outside, you're going to have to have ice on the windows, and um, that's where we'll see an increase of stolen vehicles. So, please, um, if you run your cars outside, either be in them, be out there, or lock your doors, um, because we'll see an increase of that. Our patrol division, Captain Johnson actually has patrol deputies patrol the neighborhoods in the morning because of that, um, so be careful with that. It's very common to be uh, awoken by a deputy uh, at 3 in the morning. I don't know if they mentioned waking people up in the morning, but you either love us or you hate us at 3 in the morning. But if your garage door is open and we find it, you're going to do one of those two things because we're going to meet you at 3 in the morning. I'll um, let you know about it. Sorry. Also, a major said if you see, see, see something suspicious, call 911. I'm going to give you an example of this. My daughter, I have a daughter who's 13 years old. She was getting on a school bus and the subdivision we live out in the county was getting hit with burglaries. She texted me and um, said, hey, there's a car that just like two weird guys out in the neighborhood. So I leave the office, I call Captain Johnson, he sent some patrol officers out there, saw the neighbor walking a dog, asked him, he's like, oh yeah, he went this way. I said, you think it was something suspicious? I'm like, well, yeah, these people don't belong in the neighborhood. Well, he didn't want to call 911 because he didn't think it was worthwhile. Well, we stopped, the deputy stopped him had stolen jewelry and was able to connect with several burglaries out in the county and wow. inside the city. So never be afraid to call 911. I know we talked about a little bit of kind of vehicle uh, theft prevention and that was keeping your doors locked, as I mentioned several times. Don't leave things in your car, period. Lock your car doors. Don't leave your garage door open or in your car unless you want someone to come in your house in the middle of the night to visit with you. Um, don't do it. Keep things out of your cars, take the extra time. If you can lock your car in the garage, park your car in the garage and make sure your doors are shut. There are alarms and there are mechanisms that will automatically shut your doors for you now or even let you know that your door is open with an app on your phone. So just be thinking about those things if you are uh, somebody who, who, who leaves your garage door open often. There are ways around that. As far as home security, lock your doors. Make sure your garage doors are shut, like I said. Invest in lighting. We all have porch lights. I drive around the middle of the night, and very few people in my own neighborhood, I see some neighbors back here too, actually. <laughs> but very few, very few people leave their porch lights on all night. I think I'm the only one on my entire street that turns on my porch lights. I don't understand that. That's what they're, they're there for night, and I don't, I don't get it. But you know, it, burglars, crooks don't like light. They don't want to be seen, and they know that a lot of people have cameras, and, you know, now. So dark is their friend, and light is, light is not. So. Turn on your porch lights. Uh, the holidays are coming, and so uh, things like mail theft and package theft are huge, and those things are going to pick up. You know, I think I've heard about the trends where folks follow the bad guys, follow FedEx and UPS drivers around, and just wait for them to drop packages. And then as soon as they drive off, they get your package. And Merry Christmas to them, and not you, <laughs> right? So uh, they're come up with plans. You can communicate with the Postal Service and FedEx and these pa all these package services ahead of time. You can create accounts. You can tell them where to hide your packages. You can tell them how to hold them. You know, uh, that, that kind of thing. If you have important documents that come or you're, you're paying bills and sending uh, money out, checks out, I would say don't put those things in your mailbox. If you're, you know, when you go down to a Walmart or your next errand out, stop at a post office and drop them in a secure post office box. That's not to say your mailbox is not totally secure and safe, but if you don't have a locking mailbox, you, I mean, you're, you're kind of just asking for it because you don't know when and where it's going to happen. And you know, once, you're, once your mail and your credit cards and those things are stolen and then you're, you're, it turns into identity theft and, and, and those kinds of frauds, it's really hard to recover from those things. So 
again, extra attention to packages and holidays and mail and those kinds of things. Um, also, if you buy uh, nice products, big TVs and stuff like that, that would help our detectives. Send me my notes. Um, <laughs> that would help our detectives if you keep documentation for us, serial numbers, descriptions for our detectives can um, <clears throat> research that, try to find it, as well as a deputy might stop a vehicle that has a bunch of stolen property in it. We know it's stolen, but it's not coming back stolen because the serial number is not entered as stolen. So a lot of times we have to give that back to the person knowing that we think it was stolen, but we can't track down the number. So it'd be very important to take time, keep it, put it in a folder, put it somewhere where if a deputy does have to come to your house, you can be able to provide that to them. The last thing I'll mention is maybe about the, some fraud or those kinds of things. Put locks on your data phones. Um, create online passwords and pins and, ch and change them regularly. It's just a smart thing to do. Protect protect those things. You know, get the same passcode for everything in your life. And just one person sees it, you know, one place, then you might be in trouble. And then use online bill paying and those kinds of things. If you're, if you're not comfortable with computers, or they make it so easy for even dumb people like me to get on. <laughs> an app on my phone and pay all my bills and check on my balances and that kind of thing. I say all my balances like there's a bunch. But, um, so just be thinking about those things. The crooks are always, they're, they're always ahead of us. You know, they're always one step ahead and we don't know what they're going to do until after they've done it. And so it's up to you all to be vigilant and be neighborly. Be friends with your neighbors. I think Kathy's going to come up and tell you about how to look at the crime maps and maybe some crime prevention and some of the tools that we have for connecting for you to help you folks connect with each other and, and your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the resources that we have. So bear with me as I get out of this slideshow and take you guys on, on a trip on the internet. So one of the places that you can go online which has the crime map is called Raids Online, and I think it's <laughs> And Raids Online actually covers um, the entire United States um, of different agencies that participate in this program. So for you living here in Missouri, if you have family that lives in Florida, New York, California, North Carolina, if you have a potential college student that's going to go over there, you can also check this map to see what crimes are occurring in that area. So it gives you a little bit of peace of mind when you have family that's um, not in the same state as you, and you can kind of uh, cruise around and see what's happening in that area. So on this, what we will do is we will go to Greene County, Missouri, this website you can log in and you can see the different things that are occurring throughout Greene County including with inside the city of Springfield Republic I believe they also participate in our system here for the Greene County Sheriff's Office we our information refreshes every 10 hours and that happens to coincide with our ships as well for the city of Springfield, it repopulates every 24 hours. So if something happens in your neighborhood and you're kind of curious as to what happened down the street, what happened um, at a neighbor's home, if there's some crime trends that are happening within your subdivision, you can go to this crime map, plug in your address, and see what's been going on around you. And you can set the parameters as far as what happened within the past three days, what happened within the past week. If you're looking at moving into a new neighborhood, you can set it out as far as a year. So you can see what kind of things have been occurring in that area, if they've been hit with burglaries a lot, if they've been hit with a lot of vandalism. But when you get to this, you can click on any of these little dots to see what um, that report is for and who took that report. 
that dot that I picked right there, it tells you that a theft or a stealing had occurred, stealing report had occurred within the past week. And it gives you a general area, North Farm Road 9, and I think that's going to be 160. And it says that it was by, taken by the Green County Sheriff's Office. So it gives you some general information about what's occurring, what happened, what type of report that was there. And you can get reports sent to your phone, sent to, your, to you by email, so it comes often. If you want to check on something, as far as if you want to know how many burglaries happen every week, you can get that report done and sent to your email inbox. So that's one of the many different resources that we have. We also encourage people to connect with us and other neighbors on nextdoor.com. If you haven't signed up for nextdoor.com, it's meant primarily for neighborhood watch programs. It's also meant for different um, residents within a subdivision to speak with one another as it relates to crime trends, as it relates to um, even sale posts within that neighborhood, you guys can do that. If you don't have one set up, you can go in, you can sign up and you can become a lead on this and include different areas. See all the different subdivisions that are in this. <clears throat> we will go with one that's in our area right here since we are speaking in District 4 area. Greater Park Crest area, Chesterfield Village, Royal Oaks Carriage Park, Golden Meadows, Fairfield Village, all the different subdivisions are already included in there and you just have to go in there and connect with them and you will just get information that's specific to that subdivision. We use nextdoor.com a lot to push out information as far as it relates to crime trends, um, things that we believe that you should be aware of. We also have our Facebook page, Twitter account, um, YouTube channel, and Nixle. If you text the word green, G-R-E-N-E, -E, to triple eight triple seven, you will get text alerts on your phone of events that are occurring. If there's, say, um, a pursuit that's going through Green County and we think that you need to be aware of what's going on, if there's a major investigation, if there's a lost child or a lost um, adult that's uh, in danger, we'll put information out that way so you can get it immediately to your phone instead of having to log into a computer or wait for the news to um, come on at five, six, nine, ten. Uh, and find out that way. What was so, that again? Um, it is our text alert system, Nixle. If you text the word green, G-R-E-E-N-E, -E -E, to triple eight triple seven, that'll automatically sign up your phone number to get those text alerts. So those are some of the resources that we do have. And just to talk about, um, some of the partnerships that we have and what we encourage to do is like I said, sign up and receive some phone or text alerts from us. Um, if you have a neighborhood watch program, we suggest that you go ahead and um, connect with one another, hold meetings, uh, start a newsletter. And obviously you guys have already done this part is attending our community advisory meetings. It's a good opportunity to know what's happening in your area, find out what the current trends are, um, and meet those people who live in your area, see what's affecting them as well, and see what resources that we have. And it's an opportunity for you to engage with us and ask us questions that has kind of been looming in your mind and you don't know when to ask or who to ask. You can follow us on social media. And these are some of the other things that I talked about as well. And just like Major Corcoran had talked about, you know, get to know your neighbors. Uh, we, you know, you all live in those neighborhoods. You know what's normal. You know what's abnormal. You know who's going out of town. You know what cars belong in that area. Get to know one another so that way when something is out of the ordinary, you can call 911 and let us know what's happening um, and look out for one another. Maybe prevent a crime from happening. If somebody's on vacation, um, instead of them coming home and finding out that they've been burglarized, you now know that they are expected out of town. No vehicles are supposed to be there. You can call 911 and help us catch those people. Learn about the crime trends that are happening in your area and call 911 to report any suspicious persons or behavior immediately. And let us be the ones to confront these people, these individuals, let us do the investigation. And if you have your cell phone with you, you know, call 911, take a photo of it. If it's a suspicious vehicle and it happens to leave the area, at least now you've got an accurate depiction or an accurate picture of what that vehicle looks like and possibly a license plate number, which could help as well. 
from one to the hundred over to the one. Can you text those to that number? You cannot text those to that number, but um, all of our contact information is, I can give that to you as well. Um, so that way you can either email it to us, or if you go to that nextdoor.com, you can send us a message there too. Mm -hmm. And also, one of the, the, the best resources is to go to greencountymo.gov, which is our website. I go to the sheriff section, and we'll have a link to most of these resources <coughs> there. Uh, and, and if you have a question, you can get a hold of us also. Hello again. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy Lynn, and I work in the administrative division. And it really is the umbrella for everything that you don't, you wouldn't think of behind the scenes that happen at a sheriff's office. But one of the uh, members of the administrative division is Kathy Besser, and uh, she is talking about all these ways to communicate with the sheriff's office and the information that we push out, whether that be social media or, or texting or nextdoor.com. And she works very diligently to make sure that you all are informed of the information that we deem appropriate to disseminate. And she does that whether she's working, whether she's off, whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Uh, she works really hard at doing that to make sure that you all have the information that you need. Uh, the other aspects of the administrative division, Major Corcoran had touched on professional standards. We do all the hiring for the Sheriff's Office, which is the much more pleasant experience other than the, the disciplinary issues that we have to deal with from time to time. But also, the campus security staff that you see at the Sheriff's Office at the front door when you come in, they check every visitor that comes into the Green County Judicial Facility. We're on track to be at about 275,000 visitors to the Judicial Facility, so that's a lot of handshakes and a lot of short conversations. Uh, that have taken place with our staff and the community when they come in. In our training division, we have a lot of community outreach aside from the responsibility of having to train the 350 members that we have at the Sheriff's Office. But within that, it encompasses our DARE program. DARE is something that unfortunately is being eliminated because of tax or because of budget reasons across the country. Uh, Sheriff Arnott has viewed that as a priority and has worked through donations and any way that we can run that program possible to make sure that a we have that positive interaction with children in the schools but then also that we're educating children on the troubles of uh, drugs and alcohol but also bullying and general moral turpitude uh, things so we're proud to be able to have that uh, also within a training division on this bottom picture we have a deputy uh, that we work in conjunction with the parks to be able to uh, interact with you through our equestrian program out at the equestrian center he helps give lessons and then also is kind of the liaison between the parks board and us uh, for our posse and our posse is, is uh, really a very needed program that we have at the sheriff's office because of our rural environment a lot of times if we have a missing child or we have a missing person or an evidentiary search or anything along those lines we utilize the posse to come out on horseback and search a much larger area than you could do on foot in a much quicker amount of time. Back over the summer, you may have heard or gotten the news alerts or seen on the news that we had a small child uh, that had uh, pretty severe mental health issues and was missing in the woods. And it was actually uh, getting ready to turn dark and we, were, we didn't have any shoes on. We were really concerned about him. Had the helicopter up and the whole deal, but it was our posse that found him were out in the woods and they located him and were able to make that uh, positive outcome. So we do all of the training, we uh, campus security, our professional standards, our civil division, they serve uh, an enormous amount of civil paperwork. Everything that comes through the courts and has to be served is done through the sheriff's office or at least in large part. Uh, so we stay very busy with that. But then also all of our volunteer programs uh, that we have, whether it's our Explorer program that our kids from the age of 16 to 20 can be involved in that. And, and it's, it's really a good recruitment tool for us because we can get youth involved and interested in law enforcement and our hope and desire is that they'll develop a, an, a strong enough interest that they'll want to come to work for us and already be familiar with the Sheriff's Office. Our Citizens on Patrol is another vital resource that we have through the administrative uh, service division. If you're going on vacation and you would like someone to keep an eye on your house, give us a call. We'll refer it to our citizens on patrol. You may have seen them out there. It's a COP on the side of the cars. Uh, Terry back here in the 
uh, Beck is, is one of our key members to the to the, our COP program. If there's a problem in the neighborhood, wrong Terry, Terry. Uh, <laughs> we got two Terry's here tonight. Uh, but she'll contact you directly if there's a problem in your neighborhood, so long or at least the neighborhood watch captains. Uh, if we're having a, a crime trend or something that's higher than normal, we try and have that direct communication to have as much interaction with you all that we can to try and do what we're supposed to do by serving and, and providing you with the information that you need to protect yourself or take precautionary uh, measures. One of the things, aside from everything that we do in admin services that I wanted to visit about for just a few moments tonight is Halloween coming up. We talked about uh, the other holidays that are quickly approaching us, and before we know it, it'll be 2017, but Halloween is at the end of this month, and it falls on a Monday this month. Well, that probably means that we're going to celebrate Halloween three or four times. Because some kids are going to go out on Friday, some kids are going to go out on Saturday, some parents are going to go out on Sunday because they don't want to do it on school, you know, on Monday night after school. But then also, we'll have uh, trick or treaters out and about on Monday night. So we want you all to take an extra precaution and make sure that we're safe from driving through the neighborhoods during that time. But also take proactive measures to protect yourselves and your property. Uh, you don't always get the treat; sometimes you get the trick. Uh, so you want to make sure that. You don't provide opportunity for someone to dump your trash can over or TP your house. That's kind of hard to prevent, but uh, do anything you can just to be aware that kids are going to be out and probably being a little more honorary than normal. But one of the other things that we do at the sheriff's office, and we get this question a lot during Halloween, is is the sex offender uh, issue that everybody is afraid of during Halloween. For those of you that don't know, they're not supposed to have their porch light on. There's supposed to be a sign up that uh, there's no trick or treating. But then also, the sheriff's office will have a, a task force, if you will, detectives that will be out that night going around our known sex offenders' residences and making sure that their porch lights are on, making sure that they don't have trick or treaters at their door. So if you know of sex offenders that live in your neighborhood and you see this type of activity, absolutely call and let us know and we can address that. But we're going to try and attack it proactively as well. Uh, potential for vandalism, obviously, like I said, and anything that you deem uh, suspicious, obviously call 911. Uh, if the clowns are in the woods and not at your door trick-or-treating, we would consider that suspicious. So uh, if you have any issues, be sure and let us know and we'll come out and address those to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Andrew? Okay, so CCW, everybody's got some questions probably on that, so I'm going to touch uh, a little bit about that, and then, then I'll answer some questions for you, since uh, we've been doing all the talking and we want to hear a little bit from you. Um, now, there's some very confusing legislation, because uh, when the legislators themselves that pass the bill don't understand 100% of it, it's tough for us to figure it out also. Um, as you know, constitutional carry uh, is going into effect um, basically in January 1st um, of next year. And basically what that means is you don't have to have a CCW permit in the state of Missouri to carry concealed. There, uh, there's also several other things that, that fit within that bill. One of the things that, that came out is that if you are a felon, you can also carry a concealed weapon, which is true. You can, but you can go to jail. Um, 
the issue is, is that you, it, it is not against the law for a convicted felon to carry a weapon concealed, but it is against the law to have a weapon. Yeah. Okay. So they put that out in the news. There's a lot of confusion, and we'll see what convicted felons, uh, if they sort it out or not, we'll let you know what the stats are next year. Um, so it still is illegal for a convicted felon to to possess a firearm. Uh, just not illegal for him to have it concealed. Uh, Doesn't make any sense. Um, you've also heard about lifetime permit and and ten year permits and, and those things that have, have come out. Um, that is true, you can get a lifetime permit. The problem is, is you can't carry that gun outside of Missouri with a, with a lifetime permit. So uh, it really does no good. The, we would we still be issuing CCW permits at the Sheriff's Office. And that is for the folks that, number one, want to keep their concealed weapon uh, permit. And if you travel outside the state of Missouri, you can legally, with the, Cape, the states that reciprocate uh, our law, which there's Terry, how many, how many states are reciprocal states for Missouri, do you know? 33, I believe. Okay, yeah, he was, he was in the 30s. And so, um, so you'll be able to carry concealed in that state. So uh, the permit uh, provision is still in there. I still encourage you, if you want to carry a concealed weapon, go take a class. Uh, the biggest thing about that is not just the gun education, but it's the legal education. The legal education, the part of what's going to happen when I do use my firearm, because that's the thing that you really have to think about. Are you going to lose everything you work for? Are you going to lose your house and all your savings because you made a bad choice and you didn't educate yourself on what the laws are? That's what I encourage you to do. Take a CCW course, even though it's not allowed, even though it's not uh, mandatory that you do it if you carry inside the, the state of Missouri. But it's going to educate you on the laws and give you a little education on firearms handling. Very little, but it gives you a little. Any education is better than none, and I think we can all agree on that. So I am very pro Second Amendment. I'm very pro uh, concealed carry. A lot of people ask me about open carry. Do I have any issues with open carry? And this is this is what I this is the kind of the scenario I give you. I live in a small town of Fairgrove, so it's it's pretty small. We have an MFA and you know the, the feed store up there and so it's not abnormal over the last 10 years for me to walk into MFA and a farmer be in there with a revolver uh, in an open carry thing which caused me no alarm whatsoever in fact it, it just may have caught my eye and I kept going that doesn't bother me now if you take that same scenario and you put it at the north side Walmart people react a little bit different and so it's really about where you carry, where you open carry, you know. Uh, yes, it will be your right in January that you can open carry, but here's how I could, you know, my wife is sitting back there and we went out to eat a few weeks ago and one of the things was there was a guy that comes in with a, uh, an open, wearing a gun, open carry, um, and his gun, probably his gun and his holster cost a total of $35. So that didn't concern me much because it probably wasn't gonna go off anyway. <laughs> but. The issue was, is, you know, the question was posed to me, aren't you worried about that? Doesn't that concern you? And it doesn't. I look at it as like the coach on a football team. You know, uh, I may be really proud of my team and know uh, that I've got a good team, but that doesn't mean I'm going to give the plays to the other coach. And, and it's the same way with open carry. You know, why do you think law enforcement become targets? Because we open carry and we're visible. Well, when you open carry and you're visible, you may become a target. Um, now the guy that's carried, that's the guy or gal that's got the CCW, they're going to take care of the business after you're the target. You know that's the one that's going to have the plane and take care of business. So I encourage you carry concealed. Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of information going out uh, as far as municipalities what they're going to do uh, because there, as you know in different cities there are ordinances just like on the front door here that says you know no firearms permit, permitted concealed or otherwise. Well, it's a violation of a city ordinance. Um, but it's not really a violation, it's a, it is a violation of state law if they ask you not to come in, you know, if they post it and you come in, uh, you potentially could have a trespass issue if, if they ask you to leave. But the bottom line, folks, and I'm not advocating you breaking the law, but if it's concealed and you do it properly and you do what your training tells you, nobody's ever going to know. Okay? So, just be responsible. 
owning a firearm, carrying a firearm as a responsibility, take it seriously and carry it concealed and nobody's gonna know that you have it. Um, and we'll see what's gonna happen. There are several cities deciding what they're gonna do. Uh, now the constitutional uh, carry is, is hitting on January 1. Um, whether they're still gonna post those signs or they're gonna repeal the ordinances, well, I'm not sure what they'll do. Uh, different cities will do different things. Very liberal cities, you know, will uh, be trying to be anti-gun and, and hopefully down here, we're not. Um, a lot of people ask me, what, what do we do when we're, we encounter a law enforcement officer and we're carrying a concealed weapon? Just let us know. That's really all we care about. You know, if you, if you get stopped and the officer comes up, to the, uh, comes up to your car, keep your hands on the steering wheel and just let them know, hey, I'm a CCW permit holder or I, I'm carrying a gun or there's a gun in my car. That's really what we want to know. And, it, and everything will be fine. Uh, just let us know what's going on. Um, did I cover everything on CCW, Andrew? Okay. All right, so let me open it up for any questions that you, you may have, uh, either myself or the staff member that can answer for you. Yes, ma'am. With the uh, constitutional carry, I noticed that a lot of the media has reported that there's a stay in your ground provision, aka, you know, won't we'll grab a duty to retreat. But if you actually look at the bill, it doesn't necessarily say that within. So I just kind of wanted to get your perspective on what you're saying. Well, that's a great question. So for those of you who couldn't, couldn't hear, there is a stand your ground provision uh, in the CCW bill. And what I've been advised, because uh, it is very confusing, um, that you need to read it uh, and try to understand it, but we are hoping that we can get some things cleared up with state legislators uh, next year. We'll try to clear that up, because it, it is not, it, there's a lot of gray in it, like you said, and it's, it's not easy to, uh, for, for us to even understand less than, than you all. And, and we try to enforce the laws every day, but sometimes lawmakers pass laws that don't make sense. And this is part of that bill that is not clear at all. So that's a great question, but I'm afraid I can't answer it for you because I don't know yet either how that's, that's all going to come out. One thing that we are doing, and uh, Corporal Esri is putting up uh, YouTube videos in connection to our website. Uh, and information about CCW as it progresses, and we're going to be we're going to be following this legislation. I'll be up at uh, the Capitol in Jefferson City trying to get some things straightened out uh, and more clear. So we'll update you as we get things and get opinions. Uh, unfortunately, there's not always a good clear-cut opinion until something happens, <laughs> and then they they either want to make the person a martyr or they want to. Um, you know, prosecute. So we, we've got to kind of figure out uh, which direction it's going to go. Yes, sir. What was the uh, reason the legislature passed that one? That's a good question. The question was, what was the reason the legislator, legislators passed that law? Well, here's the big deal. You know, lobbyists are a big thing. You know, I'm an NRA member. I'm pro-NRA. I'm pro-gun. Uh, NRA carries a big stick in Jefferson City, uh, and nobody really wanted to vote against uh, a constitutional carry and that's why you know when bills come through they're not just on one subject as you all realize they come in uh, an omnibus bill will come in with five different laws or ten different laws in it and this bill kind of kind of slipped through without nobody asked law enforcement what their opinion is or nobody asked sheriffs who do this you know issue the CCW permit <clears throat> our opinion specifically on the wording of these bills before they got through. So um, that's the issue. They just pass things and then we go back and try to clean it up, to be quite honest. But overall, it is really a, a pretty good statute. But the we need to clear up some things on the standard ground. Um, we need to, uh, you know, the, the lifetime permit was kind of messed up because you can buy a lifetime permit, but then you can't go out of the state. So because other states don't recognize it. So why have it? Because you don't have to have a permit to be in Missouri in the first place. So a lot of those things just don't make sense. Uh, but there's a few good shining things out of it that we just need to clear it up. Good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, even after January 1st, are there some areas that we need to know that are always off limits on a consumer carrier? Uh, places that are off limits? Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Courthouse. 
courthouses, uh, churches, those type of things that are listed in the state statute are, are off limits. Now, you may have churches that are good with it, but they could list, they could put a church that is not for it. Uh, but government facilities are definitely out. Uh, you know, the public library, schools, those things. Uh, federal courthouse, definitely you'll get a 10, 10 year sentence if you go in there with one, so don't do that. Uh, but and then, of course, municipalities is, is different from from each city. Polling places too. Yeah, polling places is also, which could be, you know, a lot of our polling places here at churches too. So. Yes, sir. Uh, back to the first, I, I have a question about how many inmates would have serious mental health issues out of that 600 and some on average? Yeah, the question is, how many inmates out of the 600 and some would have serious mental health issues? I have a team of psychologists. I have two psychologists that are full-time that work for the Sheriff's Office and then a staff of interns. And we've looked at this at various times, and you're looking at anywhere, they will say, the doctors will say, 80% people have mental illness. But out of that 80%, how much is serious? And we're looking at 20 to 30% are serious mental illness. Um, a lot of the things that we're trying to do is hook those people up while they're in custody with some help, uh, some help on the outside. We have great partnerships uh, with Jordan Valley Health Center and some other uh, borough that is helping us with some private partnerships to try to get people help. But it, mental illness is a, is, a, is a big issue, and I think everyone in here has family or knows somebody that has some mental illness. And it, and it is a, a tough deal for us to deal with every day. In fact. We do more training on crisis intervention training, which is basically dealing with mentally ill, uh, than we do our firearms. And that's because that's the biggest encounter that we have. Uh, but we can also, we do things different than we used to. We actually can somewhat of a basic diagnosis of maybe what mental illness they have, or are they having a drug problem? You can, there's a lot of things, whether it's a paranoid schizophrenic, uh, that can mirror uh, some drug psychosis, but the deputies are being trained of how to figure that out. And then we deal with them in different ways. And so that's where a lot of our training goes. Anybody else? Yes, sir. How much time does the Sheriff's Department have to spend taking people that, from, uh, that you're not able to house to other facilities and the dollars and cents of that? and what can we do as a, a group in the community to help you to get to the point where you've got enough room to put the prisoners that you need to put there? That's a great softball question for me. I love that question. <laughs> uh, because it is something that we deal with every day. There is any, anywhere from 8 to 15 deputies on the road every day moving prisoners around the state of Missouri. Every day. Um, as far as the total cost, I... I I know one of these guys have it because I've asked for it several times and I've talked about it, but I just didn't come prepared for that question tonight. But the cost is pretty high. Not, not only do we pay the transportation and the logistics of moving those people around and keeping track of them, but then we got to pay their board bill. So we're paying another county $45 a day to house each one of those inmates. Uh, so what can the community do to, to help us or support us with this issue? You'll be seeing, I'm sure, in the future, uh, we're going to have to look at doing something, and it's got to be a financial thing, so it's probably got to be a tax, to be honest. Uh, that we have to build a bigger jail. That's just the bottom line. We have 601 uh, beds. We can't go over that uh, because the city fire marshal came in and said you will only have 601 beds. Uh, but then I also got the city of Springfield that sued me because I won't take their prisoners, so that makes sense you know, figure it out. I don't let the judge figure it out because I don't know uh, what they want me to do. But we only have 601 beds. We're housing people outside. A community our size and the issues that we have, we should have an additional 1,000 beds. We should have a 1,500 bed jail. Um, now I'm not saying we're going to fill a 1,500 bed jail up right away, but I guarantee you we'll fill 1,000 beds pretty quick uh, because we're only a few hundred away. And we're growing at an increase uh, about every year of 40 to 50 additional inmates that we're holding. So a lot of people, I'm going to spin into that because a lot of people ask me, why are you holding so many people? What's, what's the holdup? 
because these are all pretrial detainees. These are people that are not sentenced to go to prison. These are pretrial detainees. <clears throat> it is shown by the stats that the judicial system has slowed down uh, to where they're not processing them through. There is nothing that the sheriff can do to fix that. Uh, I've made suggestions, but uh, there's only a few things that I can do. The judges are really in control of that situation. So basically the jail is the backlog of those people because as the system slows down, uh, we can't get them through. Now I can tell you every Tuesday and Wednesday, we run about 60 to 70 people up to prison every week, every week. If, if, if you've seen our, our bus, uh, it's a big silver, uh, it says prisoner transport, uh, 43 passenger bus, it's full, and then we have another large, smaller bus that it's full the next day, and we run them, that's every week. Uh, so we are shipping them to prison, but the system is not moving fast enough. Prosecutor's office, we have a great prosecutor's office. I can't uh, brag enough about uh, Dan Patterson and the staff that he's got. We work great together. They can only do so much, and they're spread thin, and they need more people. Uh, in fact, I can tell you, they need more people before I do, and, I, and that's saying a lot, because I do, I do need staff. Uh, these guys are cringing when I say that, because they know they have to pick up the extra work, but we really need to work on the system. Uh, but before that, we've got to have a jail, because we have done enough of programs and probation and all this crap that we put out, uh, letting people out of jail, being booked and released. I am done with that. We need to hold the prisoners that need to be held, and we need to hold them accountable. And the only way we can do that is have more bed space. So eventually, that's what we're going to look at. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Did you mention the take of the MAO program? Oh, so you're taking two minutes. No public hearing today. Is that the city council members to take one? Yes, ma'am. Would you expand the existing jail, or do we have to start with finding a place that the neighborhood would allow to yeah. build a whole new facility? Great question. The question is, would we expand where we're at, or would we go to somebody's neighborhood and build a jail? <laughs> well, hey, everybody's going to say not my neighborhood. Right? And so it doesn't matter where we go. So really the only solution uh, is to build where we're at. Now, as you know, it is crowded downtown. There's no parking. But what we'll do um, basically is have to build up in a tower. Uh, I don't have many floors. I, I, haven't, I don't have any renderings or anything like that. We've not gone that far, but we'll have to build, basically have to go up over our existing facility. And to keep them close proximity to the court, so we're not having transport costs and then duplicating a set of uh, employees of another facility. So that's kind of our plan. Yes, sir. Six, seven hundred prisoners. How many in the county, how many in the city? Uh, the question is, out of six to seven hundred prisoners, how many is county and how many is city? Uh, I can tell you that, sir, exactly. Hold on here. <laughs> Every day I put out a re the, uh, my staff puts out a report. I don't put it out. They put it out at my request that has sent. Uh, I've got it. So today, out of the population that you heard, we have um, about 660 or 70, roughly. Um, 439 are inmates that committed a crime inside the city of Springfield and arrested by the Springfield Police Department. And then I'll give you the next highest numbers. 127 are inmates that committed crimes out in Greene County that are arrested by Greene County Sheriff's deputies. 20 uh, are, inmates, are inmates that are in there on charges from the Missouri State Highway Patrol and that is out in the county also. Uh, the next highest one is Republic Police Department that has uh, 19 prisoners in for committing 19 different crimes in the city of Republic. So I track those every day. In fact, I send them to every city council member every morning. <laughs> I'm not being uh, antagonistic, but the, the deal is, is that you have to own what is yours. And uh, people that commit the crimes inside the city limits, whether it's a state charge or a municipal violation, those are people that are committing crimes in that vicinity and affecting those people. Um, and as you can see, the sheriff, you would think, would have the lion's share of the people in jail. 
and, and I don't. We, it's, it's a majority of people that commit crimes in the city. And, uh, but that's where our population and that's where our crime is. And, and you can see where our crime rates are in the city or are going up every day. You can't wake up and not hear of a robbery at a convenience store somewhere. And that tells you the type of, of the crime. So they're housing their prisoners in your jail and they don't have any facilities of their own? No, no, and, and, it, and it, I'm not against that. That's not the issue. Yeah. Um, because they committed crime, state crime, so robbery, rape, homicide, uh, and they need to be in the, in the county jail. That's where they should be held. The issue that the city has ongoing right now is that I won't take the people that are skateboarding on the sidewalk, smoking in a public building, uh, and that's what the lawsuit is over. And that there's just no room for those people. Uh, Ma'am, back there. Yeah, thank you. Going to the opposite side of this problem, how much of this criminal activity do you think is related to drug abuse and drug abuse? Oh, almost all of it. Uh, great question. Um, the issue that we see, and we, we did a poll in the jail, our, our interns and staff, we brought some interns in to do a poll because I wanted to know uh, how many people are in there related to drugs. And uh, almost, it, it was, right at 90% were in there related to drugs or an addiction problem, which could have been alcohol also. Um, that is the thing that we see is substance abuse leads to domestic violence, substance abuse, alcohol abuse leads to stealing and supplying the drugs uh, for your habit and the list goes on and on and on. And that's, that's what we see. Now, if you go in into the mail section uh, of our pods, which each pod uh, where there's two correctional officers houses 120 inmates. If you go to that male section, they'll say they're in there because of a woman somewhere down the road. Uh, if you go to the female section, they'll say it's because of a male, and it usually is. I mean, it's, it's the bottom line. It's, uh, if you notice one of the stats that was in there about fraud uh, or forgery, 45, the majority of those are uh, female inmates that have committed that at the direction of their husband, boyfriend, Sad, sad stuff. Yes, sir. Do the inmates from the Green County Jail go to a particular prison, or I mean, how do they determine what prison they go to? Who goes to Fulton? Who goes to where? Sure, great question. So the question is, how do we determine which prison they go to? They all go to Fulton. Fulton is what's called a diagnostic center, so it's like the first stop shop. They diagnose them to see if they've got medical issues. Are they a gang member? Uh, with the severity of the crime, criminal history, all that stuff, and then they determine which prison they go to from there. And, and actually, it's not just Fulton, it's... Uh, Vandalia. It? Vandalia is another diagnostic center, but that's that's where they go and then they split up. Somebody over there. I'll ask one more question. I'll get How you much uh, gang activity is are you all seeing in the building in Green County? You know, organized gang activity, it's not like it was in the 90s, uh, where it was very uh, um, uh, very obvious and there's lots of signs and people claiming certain gang affiliation. What we do see now, and especially in this district, southwest uh, in the county, is we see a lot of gangs coming from Mississippi, they come from Chicago, uh, they come in here and commit crimes. They, we're a good market to sell drugs. Uh, to be honest, now, uh, Drug dealers are coming in with their marijuana, and then they're giving a sample of heroin for free to get people addicted to heroin again. Because heroin's, heroin's making a big comeback in our community. That's the way they're doing it. It's a marketing technique, and, and it works. Because once they try it, they get hooked, and now they're not buying marijuana, they're buying heroin, which has a better resale value from the drug dealer's perspective. So, uh, very disheartening, but that's that's what's happening. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Two-part question, back with the, the uh, weapons issue both with the CCW and with the constitutional carry that's coming in my understanding and I want to verify among my other friends that are also concerned with this and let other than the businesses or places that you mentioned courthouses schools churches etc unless a place is posted no weapons then we have the right to carry concealed into that business be it a grocery store department store shoe store wherever is that correct that's correct let me expand on that for your next question so yes but go back to what i said also <clears throat> and i'm not advocating you violate a municipal ordinance 
But if you do in Greene County, you're not going to jail because there's no room for a <laughs> <laughs> The deal is, go back to kind of what I was saying, is if you are effective in carrying a concealed weapon, nobody is going to know. So if you're responsible, you follow your training, you keep it concealed, it's not going to be an issue. And if you do go into a building that's marked, other than a courthouse, those type of things, but one that's posted out here and you're carrying a concealed weapon, someone discovers it, the only thing they can do is ask you to leave. And if you don't leave, then you can be charged with trespassing. Okay. But well, I was just curious, Joe, because I do work in a place, a couple places where there is a lot of public in and out. Some of my coworkers are freaking out over this, and I keep telling them, it's not a problem. It's not an issue, you know. Right. But number two, then, relative to that, and because I, I am thinking of one of the places where I work, if a business has, oh, let's say most of the grocery stores as an example, they've got more than just one door into the building. Do they, do, you may or may not know this, do they have to have that sign posted on every door? And especially if they have that vestibule where there's a, an outside set of doors and an inside? Probably not. I mean, okay. I'm going to say probably not. It's a municipal ordinance, so they'll probably say that it has to be posted on the door, the main door, and it has to be so you know 12 by 12 so i would say no i was just thinking because i'm thinking you know if, if you don't go in the door that's posted how do you know and then they're right on your case about it it's like well wait a minute you've got eight doors into your building how am i supposed to know right and the big thing i'll go back to this the big thing carry concealed and don't tell anybody that you're that you're carrying concealed um, like i said i'm not advocating that you take a gun into a place that you're not supposed to be but if you're doing everything right, you're not going to have an issue. And, and, and if you take the training and you know what your rights are and you read the statutes, you know when you're going to act and when you're not. You know, uh, if somebody steals a purse and runs out somewhere, should you take chase and, you know, draw your weapon, that type of thing? I don't know. You know, that's your decision, but think about it. Think about what happens if you do. What well, if they call your bluff and stop and challenge you, and then you do have to take a life? You've got to think of the things that you're capable of doing. I can't tell you what to do in those situations. Each one is different. But weigh it out. Know your rights. Know what's on the line. I mean, I, I've had a lot of people before CCW happened and before we had a castle doctrine in Missouri, and, um, you know, the old question was, hey, Sheriff, if I shoot them, do I got to drag them in through the front door? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. But, you know, you have more rights now uh, as a citizen. You don't have to retreat, and you don't have to be the resident of that house. But there are certain things that can change that, so I can't give you a cookie-cutter response, but you've got to be, you've got to know what your rights are and what you possibly could lose if you make the wrong decision. Well, I've seen people see come in both, and I know some of them are concealed. It doesn't bother me at all, but we've also had people come in open carry, and that's when some of my coworkers just really freak out and they want it posted, you know, no weapons, et cetera. And that's why I was sure. asking about the, the signage issue. Right. Good question. Does the sheriff's office have the current, the current laws, a booklet of the current laws? It's posted, Kathy, uh, our CCW staff, is it posted on our website, the uh, latest, or is it on a YouTube video? Yes, it's, a, it's on a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And that's a link from where? It's on, yeah, it's on our, on our Facebook page and it's on our, we can put it on our county page as well. Okay, we'll put it on the county page, but you like us on Facebook and you'll get all of our uh, information. That was a plug for Kathy. Yeah. Um, but you, we put out that information, we're putting out videos, we're putting out those things to try to keep everybody as informed as possible. If you want the full bill, you can go to one of the Attorney General side or the Missouri uh, uh, 678 government site and then just look. Yeah, Bill 678. but. Like I said, there's some things we've got to clear up. I'm hoping we'll get to it. Yes? Do you know when the next training class of the citizens on patrol is going to be? Uh, Captain Lynn? We started making some applications for that. And, okay. and really, uh, the goal is to try and get something done over this winter period. Is um, that on the website? But there's, not, no, there's nothing oh, yeah. set definitively in stone. However, if you're interested in being involved with the citizens on patrol, Call us direct to get an application because okay. that's not something you can apply for online. We'll actually give you a paper application that you'll fill out. Anything? 
anyone else? Well, yes, sir. Yeah, I don't have a question, but I have a uh, comment that I'd like to make. Yes, sir. Uh, I did it at the last neighborhood watch meeting, and I mentioned this. I brought it up. I'd like to bring it up again. My name is Bill Foreman, and I live on Butterfly Avenue. Uh, and I am a friend of mine, and he's also a friend of the church that I go to. Uh, several of us know him and spent a lot of time with him. Uh, he's in prison. He's up in Farmington right now. He's going to be getting out in March, and I'm going to have him stay with me until he gets himself settled with a job and, and so up where he can uh, start operating in a different way. Uh, I want to let people know this. Uh, he was originally charged uh, with uh, a drug, uh, with uh, dealing drugs. Uh, he was caught in a sting in Springfield, uh, and uh, he's been on the streets pretty much most of his life uh, in uh, California and then here in Kansas City. Uh, he has a couple of children. Uh, he and his wife were divorced here not too long ago. She just didn't want to, you know, hang in there with it. But his name is uh, Nathaniel uh, Thompson. And uh, he, the reason he's in prison right now, uh, he, he was not, he was charged with the, uh, on the sting with the drugs.